Welcome to An Incomplete Guide to World Domination, a podcast by creators for creators, because together we can take over the world. Joining me today is Blaze Sinkel, a woman with an interesting story to tell. try and remember to send people my phone number if I'm going to call them, but I just forgot to do that this time. Oh, no, that's okay. I'm glad you called me back. Otherwise, I've been like, whoops. Hope I wasn't supposed to be somewhere else. <laughs> All right. Um, so, how's everything going with you? We were actually just having a fireside meeting um, for some of the things our, our manager is fixing to put into play. So. Hmm. That's exciting. Anything you can it talk is. about now, or... Is that something um, for later? Uh, probably something for later. Um, I guess I can get, get more classes, podcasts, things like that. Nice. It'll be, I'll definitely have to keep an eye out for it. So, okay. So, how about we just go back to the beginning? Tell me a little bit about you and your life before you started by your side. Um, well, I was a stay-at-home mom. Um, a military, a military wife. And um, I spent 15 years in the uh, design industry, basically uh, character design, conceptual art, things like that. And that led me into my first job as a uh, looking into the indie game design, indie game character design. So uh, I spent a lot of time in the conceptual art industry before actually going into what I wanted to do for myself. I had no idea you had that you worked in indie games. It's an industry I'm familiar with. When did you decide to create your own publishing company, and what led to that? Well, honestly, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> it really was a thing where I tried to go back to work in the corporate world, like, four times. And it didn't work out. Every single time I had to put in my two weeks or quit on the spot and until after time, time four, I said, you know what, this is obviously not what I'm supposed to do or where I'm supposed to be. So I am going to stay home. I'm not going back into work. I am going to make my own business at home. And I wanted my husband to be involved because we wanted to make our own business where he could come home and work full time as well. So we started thinking, what can we do? And we honestly didn't know what to do. And then one NaNoWriMo 2017, I decided to take place. Mm -hmm. And I start, I won NaNoWriMo and had my first novel. But I started noticing this feeling inside it. Was, it was a great accomplishment to hold it in my hands. But I didn't know there was something missing. There was something that didn't quite feel feel right. So I looked into it and I was like, okay, here's what's missing. And I was like, okay, I need to turn, you know, we want to turn our, our attention to the people outside instead of just making our own books like everyone else is. Mm -hmm. So um, for a year we did it. We, you know, we took that time for a trial period for a year to learn and see what it took and, uh, figured out some tricks of the trade, and um, here this year um, we opened up our first submission, and we actually got hammered. I mean, it was it was amazing how how hammered we got. We were very <laughs> surprised. That's so awesome. So with oh. with the change of the no, you're fine. With the change of the market, with indie authors actually getting to the point where they're having more doors closed than open on them, uh, we started our small press at a good time. So what all did you have to learn in that first year? And what were some of the challenges that you faced figuring out how to get this started? Oh my gosh, what challenges didn't we face trying to get this <laughs> thing started? That's a better question, honestly. First of all, we had to figure out 
the business side. We had to see what it what it would take for us to gain the ability to sell in our state. What will we have to do in order to work under our name? The first challenge was really coming up with a name. It's always we the spent hard hours. Part. We spent hours just trying to figure out what we were going to call this thing. And I was sitting, I will never forget this because it was such an impact on, my, on our life. It was, I was sitting in the living room with my kids watching Charlie Brown Christmas. And I was racking my brain. My husband was working a closing shift and I was racking my brain. What can we call this thing? What can we call this thing? It needs a name. So one line, that one line from Charlie Brown is that you'll tie by the fireside. And it was like a light in my mind came on. It was like, wait a minute. So I looked at my electric fireplace. I looked at what my kids were watching. And then I looked at myself wrapped up in a blanket. And I was like, this is what I like. I like reading books, drinking coffee by the fireside. And what better than a combination? Then I started thinking, it's like, okay, I like the name Fireside, but I want to make it like me. So instead of doing F-I, uh, S-I, I did F-Y, S-Y. <laughs> yeah, I like that because so, it's also easier to distinguish yourself because who else would spell it that way? Oh, exactly. We we get all sorts. Of, it's like, how do you say your name? Fire, Cide? I was like, nope, Fire, Fire, It's easy. Yeah. The computer keeps trying to correct it to snide, and I'm like, N- first off, that's not how it's spelled. Second off, no. <laughs> it does that to me, too. It, it's, sometimes we have people go F, F, Y, and then have S, I. It's like, nope, it's Y and Y. There's no I. <laughs> yeah. Right. But that's how we came up with the name. And after that, we had to figure out how to do business as. And a DBA is basically how we're doing business in the state of Texas and the neighboring the neighboring states. Mm-hmm. So we, we had to go to our local county clerk's office and uh, file a DBA and make the name. And then we had to, after we got that license, we got our EIN number, which is mm-hmm. a industry industry uh, government industry number. Mm-hmm. And and that was another step we had to do, which took us down to the the EIN was fired and filed in the clerk's office as well, I believe. The tax ID was filed online. Yeah, that sounds about right. I'm somewhat familiar with the paperwork involved, although it's been over a year since I've looked at any of that stuff. Oh yeah, lots and lots of lots and lots of footwork. Many days my husband was off, we spent just driving here, there, <laughs> and then we had to open up a business account at our bank and. Uh, <laughs> to keep business from personal, had to set up a business PayPal. And then um, it's just basically a bunch of admin stuff before you can even get your stuff started. And uh, that's really what challenges, the main challenges we had to face to begin. And the second challenge was how are we going to market this thing? (laughs) Because the writing community is huge, but here's the beauty of it is um, we actually learned quickly the need of the publishing companies, most of all, was the need for the authors to be in touch with us without the need of an agent. So we are unagented. We do not require agents. We uh, we want to work directly with our authors. So we went through a lot of challenges starting out, uh, like business models, how we were going to market this thing, um, how we were going to publish, because... No, we did not work, walk out with a silver spoon in our mouth, so naturally money was a big object. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> just a bunch of challenges at first. All right, so what were some of the lessons that you learned in that first year? Um, basically, we learned the, the ebb and flow of the market. We learned the location of our audience. And surprisingly, we learned that the company flourished much better when we started attending conventions and live shows. Um, we learned what what conventions were lucrative for the business and what weren't so lucrative for the business. And we spent all that first year con- of building connections with different people that are now our partners and affiliates. Mm-hmm. So we made a network 
before we even opened our doors. And that's how we wanted to do it. Because once we opened our doors and we had that network in place, we didn't have to chase the network. We already had it in place. Networking is always very, very important. It's also, it's easier to do in person, I've found, because then you get to see people and it's easier to spot, oh, hey, this person's friendly. I'm going to go talk to them. Cause yeah, exactly. I think when I met you at the Frisco Book Fest, I probably stood there and talked to you guys for like half an hour, maybe. Yeah, that's that's very common. It's, we actually get more of that in conventions like FinCon, ReaperCon, and things like that mm-hmm. over book shows. Hmm. And I kid you not, we have a, we at times we have at least five to eight people in front of our table, all talking at once, and it. It's much more. It's much more uh, active in conventions like that, and it is an actual book festival. So that was actually a small. That was actually small for us, believe it or not. <laughs> well, I'm still glad y'all were there. That's because it, it's been great he- hearing more about what you guys do, and then having you come through my line twice in one day. <laughs> I can't help it. It's not hoarding if it's if it's books, right? <laughs> exactly. And I'm I'm actually kind of glad you mentioned the book reviewer thing because I've started picking up book blogging again. I've only done one post and it got more interaction than anything I've done in a really long time. And it was just like oh, yeah. super simple. It was me talking about my favorite book, The Book Thief, and got like two shelves of books I'm gonna do next I'm like this is this is fine I now have an excuse oh yeah just wait until you put yourself on book blogging list and things like that authors will flood to you like uh honest to a meat to a meat yeah. meat bone seriously Good um, we've actually started building a review team for people because mm-hmm. um I don't like to read certain genres but John does and then we have another person who reads different type of genre so having three of us available is actually much better because not one of us doesn't have to devote to a genre it's just not our thing yeah and that way you can also cover a wider variety of books and more books at the same time so instead of you having to read three books at the same time everyone can each focus on one Oh no, I have about five or six going at the same time, so I don't really focus well, on one book at a time. <laughs> fair enough to each their own. Well, which, you know, we are still accepting. We are adding to our review team, so if you want to be added, just let us know. We'll just send you an email with what we've got getting handed to us and see if you want it. All right, I definitely will be reaching out to you about that. But So, what are some things that you think make your company different from, say, other indie publishers or some of the bigger publishing companies? Well, our company is different, number one, and one of the biggest things that really shines a light on us is the fact that uh, we do not require an agent. We um, are oftentimes very quick on our response time for query letters, and we usually can read... Um, a manuscript usually very quickly because because um, it's our, it's my full time job. So I don't have a bunch of I'm not bogged down by a bunch of things right now to uh, to push me back. So I can get things done really quick. Turn we have a quick turnaround, which is another thing that makes it, our authors don't have to wait. We will either respond to them within 48 hours saying yes or no, and then once they give us a partial. If we want a harsh, if we want the rest, we'll tell them, yeah, we want the rest. If we don't, we'll say, sorry, this just wasn't our thing. So we're, our turnaround and our lack of needing an agent right now are really what makes us, up, make us different. Mm-hmm. And also, some of our authors that are on our docket now have told us what made us different was uh, we just seemed friendly. We just seemed approachable. We didn't seem like we were not willing to let our authors speak. We don't make them wait in their corner. We call it waiting in their corner for us. Mm-hmm. Waiting in our corner for us. So they actually are interact. They're able to interact. We had to call ourselves an author-run publishing house simply because we let our authors do a lot. Like they don't wait for us for editing. They can edit right along with us. Our edit. One of our editors at any time will sit with them in the morning or whenever they need them need us to to edit with us i mean we don't make them wait for anything so we also what we also do is we uh 
will actually help them write their quarry letter before they even quarry us. We, if they have trouble, well, we will say, um, okay, um, we didn't ask for this. Um, you need to take it back. And if they come back at us saying, uh, I don't know what I did wrong, can you help me? We'll do it. We'll help them. <laughs> That's pretty great, because just writing query letters or any sort of email to start that conversation is kind of terrifying. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we get a lot of people that we're just scared to death to talk to us. And also, <laughs> another thing, we um, our submission we do have submission windows for online submissions, but oftentimes if you come talk to us in person, we'll look at your manuscript anyway, because you made the effort to come talk to us. It's just a bunch of little things we do to... But our authors know our doors are never really truly closed. You're always welcome. We let our authors call us for goodness sakes. What are some of the other services? Because I remember when we talked to you, mentioned stuff about like with audiobooks and cover design, and you said you have an editor and book reviewers. Um, we actually do. Even if uh, if they publish to us, we have we are connected with a uh, book a book tour company. That's run by a very dear friend of mine and uh, her friend, who has become a quick friend of mine. And uh, we actually, our authors get discounts on their service. Um, we will, even if they don't publish through us, we will often refer them to our book tour company. And um, and our, they will help them from there. They're really good really good people. Otherwise, uh, the audiobook company that we were, we are partnered with actually have done, well, we'll be doing two of our books. And uh, they, if you publish through us, um, they get like 20% off, they get the percentage off of their services as well. It's just, an, and uh, our affiliates are Scrivener and Demonza, a cover design company, and a, uh, of course, the Scrivener app. So mm -hmm. if they use our name, they get a discount off of the purchase, and we get kickbacks for the affiliation. So mm. That's good to know. So we, we, um, our part, we are expanding our partnerships. We're still looking. But otherwise, we don't just offer, we also offer PR services. So if somebody just needs PR and they're already published or another publisher, but they just want personal PR, well, then we'll PR for them with for really low pricing. We're not we're not about the money. We're about what how well what can we help you with? Our courses are going to be heavily discounted as well. So we're just we're making things our accessibility to what authors need at more affordable prices, especially indie authors, because we remember what it was like to be an indie. So we are making ourselves available on multiple levels. So what you said you're working on building your partnerships. What are some what kind of partnerships are you looking to build? Well, right now we've got a cover design artist that wants to work with us. Um, she she got in touch with us and is willing to work publisher pricing. Of course, for our for our book covers, we actually already have a short list on Fiverr that we use, and our artist has been used twice. And uh, we actually, she actually is very nice, and she works with very quick with us. We also have had been reached by a uh, what was that one company that I showed you? It was like a, it was like a book promotion. It was like BookBub, and it reached out to us wanting a uh, e-books to go or something like that. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was like BookBub, but they reached out to us wanting to know if we wanted to partner with them. We're still talking about it. We hadn't decided yet. So, um, just different kind of people that find us and come to know us, and they're asking for us to uh, to partner with. They actually, most of them come to us nowadays. Otherwise, we've got a bunch of connections in the conventions we go to on a regular basis, and they're willing to help us out um, with different things, and uh, they're very friendly and always look forward to having us back. So, it's just a bunch of different networking opportunities that we know that we can get in touch with. Um, we have connections with blog, uh, bloggers. We, we have a team of bloggers that we get in touch with. We, uh, are, we get in touch with Barnes & Noble. We have multiple different connections we just reach out and grab. Yeah, you mentioned something about uh, classes coming up in the future, and you also have a YouTube channel where you do panels. We do have a YouTube channel where we post all of our panels. All of our panels are available for people to see. We do, we kid you not, during our busy, busy season, how many panels do you think we do during our busy season, honey? 
So our, my husband, he's my numbers guy. So anytime I get asked numbers, I always go to him <laughs> and make sure. He, yeah, he says that at, during our busy season, um, we can do anything up to two dozen panels. Like it, we get asked to talk all over the place. And you share them all on YouTube. Oh yeah, my husband's the video guy. He uh, he puts them up as we can as he can fast he can get them edited. And so, what are some other things like that that you're planning on doing in the future beyond just like the panels you're asked to be on? Well, we will be doing uh, courses, um, low low budget courses for base uh, catered around the basic uh, the subject the author needs. Um, we will be doing a podcast. We're looking and doing podcasts on the fo- probably focusing. We're not sure yet, but probably focusing something we are looking at is probably focusing on the business side of things because so many times authors are taken aback with just how much business is associated with uh, with running a running a book. They don't understand that once you step out of the book zone, you're stepping into the business zone, and it ain't changing. So. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what we're looking on do- at doing. Mm-hmm. Um, other things we're looking at, we're possibly looking at opening an anthology. Mm-hmm. So people can submit to an anthology. Um, we're looking possibly having an online uh, online submission your submission magazine that I can be I can will be putting together. So people can get, come see us in real and a person will be able to search our titles. Mm-hmm. So we're just there's a bunch of different things we're planning on making on coming out with because we have four authors on our docket now, so they can only grow from here. Yeah, that's four authors is pretty good considering you're you've been open for about a year and I believe your submiss- your submissions just closed about yeah, a week or so ago. Closed. So, what kind of like authors and writers do you guys prefer to work with, or is there preference or? Right now, we are. We actually like to make a joke about how we're dark publishers <laughs> because we have, uh, despite being a fireside, a fire-based uh, company, we, uh, we're kind of the dark publishers because we're giving uh, genres that have trouble publishing right now mm-hmm. preference, mainly like horror, dark paranormal romance, dark romance, uh, anything that's that dark fantasy, anything publishers nowadays are telling them um telling them oh we don't want this you can't do this like there's a lot of one of our authors came to us telling us that she submitted to a publisher and the publisher's like oh you need to take this out you need to take that out because that's not good you can't do this but we're writers we're supposed to break the rules exactly we we told her no because when i read it i could tell i was like there's i'm like i like this story but there's something missing I mean, she told me the story, and I'm like, oh, now I get it. And that's another thing that makes us unique. We do not tell writers they can't do something. So it's like their story. We want them to tell the story they want to tell. And, yeah, you don't see that a lot in publishing and, in the like, everyone everywhere is telling you, you can't write a story with that. And I'm just like, but why not? Exactly. They're they're safe publishers. I was talking to a friend. She was talking about how she wanted to do a a story with twins, and she's like, oh, but people typically don't like that. And my response was, forget what people think. Write the story. If they have a problem, they can shove it. Yeah, we tell our authors no. We want to read the story you have an intent to tell. And don't worry about the market because we'll find it. No matter how weird or out there you may think your story is, I have found that th- there are other people out there that like it, because you are not a complete and total special snowflake. There there are other people with similar interests and people that need to hear your story. Exactly. That's what we told this one that was uh, told, us about the, uh, told us about the dark romance. I was like, I was like, I knew there was something wrong. She goes, well, it wasn't the story I wanted to tell. I'm like, I knew it. I knew it. That's another thing that makes us unique. We actually hold weekly meetings with our authors, so. I do appreciate that. Um, so, what's some, like, advice that you would, that you give to authors and other creatives? Mm, that's a, that's a big, that's a big umbrella. Um, you can take this question wherever you want to. Well, the first thing I would say is to, um, if they're going indie, to make sure that they know exactly what they're getting into. 
because, like I said, the market is drastically shifting. And unfortunately, because the bad apples falling from the tree, um, many, many different venues that were once open are closing. And um, they need to be sure that that's really what they want to do. Because if sometimes it can, at this point, sometimes it can be just as much waiting to try to get a sale as it can to uh, waiting for getting an agent or a publisher. So I would actually encourage any author that's starting out to to traditionally publish their first title. They don't have to uh, do the second title. And the reason I would encourage that, because technically I'm still an indie author. I don't, I publish through my own company, so I'm not traditionally published. I'm still an indie. But where the doors that were open for me are actually closed for many others that are looking to publish. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of what you have because you're going to have a bunch of people that tell you, oh, yeah, it's great. It's flourishing. It's great. And so you build those expectations, uh, high expectations, like, oh, I'm going to be great. It's uh, awesome and blah, blah, blah. And it's like just make sure they have realistic expectations. Number two, um, write what you want. I mean, good grief. Don't, don't, write, don't write what's safe or popular. I mean, as a publisher, I plead authors to not do safe i was like please no no more no more alpha male no more please it's okay the woman can be the alpha there's nothing wrong with that so please do not no more alpha bad boy six pack macho guys that are perfect you know it's like just write some take that and write it in a completely different way yeah that cliche is a little bit overdone and by a little bit i mean the dead horse is just calling us you to stop beating it no, I heavily agree, and unfortunately, it's making it to where many company, many publishers are just saying no. <clears throat> so just don't write what you want to write, and don't write what don't write to market. Many people are going to tell you to write to market. Don't do that, um, because we're looking for something that's unique. Otherwise, some other advice I could give is to um, take their time. We're not going anywhere. The publishing company is not going anywhere. Hollywood can only ride Marvel for so long, and Netflix <laughs> is scooping up book titles. Oh, you know I'm right. Netflix is scooping up titles left and right. And they so are. Hulu, it's kind of exciting. Yeah, they're scooping up titles faster in Hollywood. So um, just be patient. And um, like Bird Box was published in 2013, and they're just now making a movie. So... And that's another thing. Don't rush to make a movie title, okay? They make the authors have very little rights when it comes to movie titles. They have so few rights; it's not even funny. Mm -hmm. So be very careful about about doing that because uh, we actually, for blessing of Luna, we got about five indie companies that wanted to work with it over Instagram, mm -hmm. like they contact us Instagram and Twitter, and like we really would like to make this a movie. And we flat turned them down. And it's basically because, number one, we want, you know, we if it's a movie, it's our book, we want to make sure that it's our book, not yours. Mm -hmm. So just make sure they know exactly what they're giving up before they rush and headlong into, I would love my stuff to be movies. Like, would you really? <laughs> Are you sure? I mean, look at Percy Jackson. And yeah. Never getting look over at that. Look at uh, Divergent and uh, Hunger Games. Hunger Games actually turned out pretty well because she was a good actress, but look at Twilight, for Christ's sake. <laughs> I almost fell asleep doing uh, that one. <laughs> but Harry Potter was actually well made. Um, mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings did well. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, you don't know who the producer's going to be. They could be just some hack coming out of film school who wants, to, wants something on his repertoire, you know? Mm-hmm. So just be careful of running headlong into that. Enjoy your book because you finished it, not because you uh, not because you want it to be a movie. I guess otherwise, also focus. Don't focus on yourself because there is nothing that makes you look look like I'm more of an ass than just buy my book bashing. <laughs> You're not wrong. Hey, I, I try to be real. You know, if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck. So um, that's really what I would I would tell them is just make sure that that you don't buy my book bash. Uh, remember that you are trying you are talking to real people who have just as much financial issue as you do. So yeah. I've heard, 
I've heard people refer to it as the 80-20 rule. 80% of the time just share stuff that people appreciate and then like 20% of the time mention that, hey, I did make a thing. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's your baby. You definitely praise it up. But, um, yeah, focus on them. Tell, make Focus on evergreen, what's known as evergreen content. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, uh, and this is a really big thing that needs to be put in bold, red, and whatever you can put it. <laughs> if you do traditionally publish or pursue a traditional publisher, please, for God's sakes, where the, read their submission guidelines page. You could actually just put it, if you would like to say, quote, from a, pub, a desperate publisher will publish for directional follows. <laughs> um, for God's sakes, read their read their their uh, submission letters. We got or submission pages. We got so many submissions of people just not following the page. It was like, guys, please, we make this for a reason. We don't need agents, but this is why many of us use agents because you guys just can't follow simple rules. It's just how many people just kind of glaze over things or don't or like don't look at things and just completely missing them like it's it's literally it's right there it is we laid that we lay out our contract rules we lay out what we're looking for we laid out how to quarry us for crying out well no people still don't that's kind of hilarious and sad at the same time <laughs> It was so bad. Um, one of my friends, who is also an indie author, actually had to retweet our tweet and say, guys, what does this say about us if we can't even follow simple directions? <laughs> that writers are very distracted human beings. <laughs> Do you have any, like, fun stories of, like, funny interactions or, like, what do you have like a favorite dumb question people ask you whenever you tell them what you do for a living? Oh my gosh, um, yes, we actually get um, this number. So, are you indie published? Let's see, we have multiple titles on our table. We just told you if you have a manuscript to talk with us, <laughs> and then we get the indie published question. It's like, um. I believe we just told you to your face. <laughs> so that's one of the most funny thing we get. We also ask, um, we also get this. So, do you publish other authors' titles? Nope. <laughs> We're like, nope. <laughs> just like, um, we we are a publishing company, so I think it's safe to assume. It's hilarious. We get some interesting people, but. It, like, yeah, we'll tell them. Our, our favorite opening line is, yes, we are here as publishers, not authors. And they're like, oh, so you guys publish? Nope. We just told you that for entertainment. You can't see right now, but I have, like, my face was in my hands for a second there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What about... We've had, we had people over the email. This is a real email. I have two stories I want to publish. That's great. <laughs> And that's really all they said. Their their line, their subject line was, "I want to publish." And mm-hmm. the one, the one line was, "I have two submissions." Okay. And what am I supposed to do with this? So yeah, exactly. <laughs> dot dot dot. <laughs> I guess not everyone spends fifteen minutes agonizing over an email like I do. <laughs> Well, if you do contact a publisher, please agonize over an email for as long as you can. But don't be too... If But, like, if it's been an hour and you've been staring at a finished email, maybe get someone else to read over it and then click send for you. Now, in that case, you just need to read over one last... It's like a, it's like a manuscript. Mm-hmm. You can... Twelve times of revision is too many. Give yourself maybe a maximum of three... And then, for God's sakes, you're done. Yeah. Like, I had somebody comment to me on Instagram. It's like, um, no. One of my authors came to me, and she's like, um, yeah, I just got a comment on Instagram. So, apparently, all you do is spend multiple hours editing and refining a piece. A manuscript. I said, nope. Not even close. <laughs> I said, we might look over it two or three times, and that's it. Otherwise, it's done. We'll consider it done. And if you want to work on it afterwards, go ahead. 
but we can't do a single manuscript like six or seven times. We just can't. We have too many to do. <laughs> yeah, and after I think after about six or seven times, that's when you just start like way overthinking things, and you start like spending a little too much time questioning that one comma in the middle of the page when it's fine. I give I give six. That's it. After that, it becomes a Swiss cheese manuscript, and I'm like, nope, that's done. <laughs> and yes, there are going to be there are going to be multiple imperfections, but you can only do so much. So I did my first book. I did it. I did like 15 times, and I was like, nope, I'm not doing this ever again. Just as long as your characters don't change names in the middle of the book, should be good. Yeah, no, no, that's one of those big red no nos. All but right. thankfully, thankfully, as a tradition, as a full time freelance ghostwriter, I have actually picked up the um, the sacred ability of making a pseudo clean first draft because I don't have the pleasure of going back through and editing it because the client wants it and then they want it now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm very happy to say I have figured out the ability to fake a good first draft. Nice. How long have you been ghostwriting, and how'd you get into that? My, um, I actually work primarily through Upwork, and the way I uh, got into it was I finished my book and had the publishing company, and then Upwork accepted my profile application. Mm-hmm. And after that, um, ghostwriting, I just had clients contacting me a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of people but, on Upwork that you want you to write all the stuff for them. Well, it's mostly publishers who are trying to start their publishing companies. They use Pin names written by ghostwriters. It's not uncommon. It's actually very common practice for beginning small presses. Yeah, I, guess I do apologize. I'm chomping on onions. I mean, I'm actually in the middle of lunch, so I do apologize for chomping. Oh no, you're fine. I couldn't tell. All right, so I no, have good. I've got um, one more question, and then I'll let you go back to your day and to <laughs> eating your lunch. Um, if you could go back and go back to the start of this and give yourself like one piece of advice or if there's something you wish someone had told you when this all started, what would that be? Oh my gosh, okay. When I first started this, I wish I knew one thing. Get at least 10 reviews before even announcing your book on social media or anywhere or holding blog tours or anything like that. Get at least 10. Because if you don't have that, you are literally wasting hundreds of dollars so take the time to garner those reviews before you even do a blog tour book list. Are you talking like beta readers reviews? Beta readers are not reviewers. Oh, true. I mean yeah. legitimate, legitimate book bloggers or uh, or publishers weekly or anybody you can get to review your book. Get at least ten, and then do blog tours, book blitzes, and all that because you are literally wasting too much money. Yeah, because you have to establish and have something for the people to look at before you can start saying, hey, look at me. Exactly. Also, and this is the truth, actually have one or two titles, maybe even three, before you even start going to conventions. It gives you more street cred with those people. I can see that, and like, cause, so that way you have more than one thing to put on the table. Exactly. It makes you, it establishes yourself as a consistent, a consistent author. Never thought about it, but it makes sense. Well, it's just, it's the change in the market Market I've learned. So many authors are so, they're like, oh, I'm going to write the coattails of this one title, and it's just like, don't do that. What I mean by writing coattails is books have shelf life. Just mm-hmm. like any, just like any chemical, just like anything, they have shelf life. You cannot establish yourself as an author on one title. If you're, ri- if you're writing because you want to finish and you want to publish because you told yourself you didn't, and then after that you get tired... Then you can be a one and done. Otherwise, if you plan on keep going with it, you better keep producing because people who people attach to authors to produce quicker titles. Like mm-hmm. one of our authors actually just finished, and she'll be releasing her first her debut novella in uh, October. But the beauty mm-hmm. of it is, we already have her telling us she's almost done with her second manuscript. So we'll mm-hmm. have things to keep publishing by her, and that way you can also. Next year. That way you can also market things ahead of time and just keep the interest going, keep the conversation going, and keep people interested in buying the first one. Exactly. We um, have created, uh, for her, we are creating demand with her paperback. 
because nowadays ebooks are so easy to sell, the paperbacks suffer a bit on Amazon. So what we've done is we're creating two two different uh, editions. The paperback will have excerpts from her second novel. Mm. The ebooks will not. So then, if they already have the ebook, they won't really want to get the paperback because it a it's nice to have and the battery doesn't die, and b they can get a taste of what's going to happen next. Exactly. I like that. That's genius. Oh, thank you. We try. <laughs> we also don't mass produce hardback. We make those exclusive to convention people, or we make them exclusive to giveaways, which creates demand. That is also genius. I never thought about thank that, you. but y'all come up with some good ideas. So, um, is there anything no. else you want to talk about, or maybe pitch or mention or anything? Honestly, not at this time. We're st- a lot of things are still under development. Mm-hmm. Um, we do have a release in October. Mm-hmm. And then we will also be, hopefully, be at FinCon in August. Oh, well, my husband's my, my, like I said, he's my numbers man. So he just told me that we had another con coming up. I think that's in September. Yeah, the end of, yeah, September. All right, yeah. I'll definitely have to keep an eye out for those. And perhaps when you have some more of that stuff that you can't quite talk about yet going on, might come back and touch base and see how things are going. Well, that'd be great. We, um, oh yeah, that's something I should tell. Thank you for reminding me. You actually reminded me. We have a Facebook exclusive group for people who subscribe to our newsletter. Oh, cool. So if they subscribe and like us on Facebook, then we will add them to this group. And these people see our cover reveals first, like months in advance. Mm-hmm. Mm. They see our book trailers months in advance. They get looks at upcoming titles that are coming that we have available. We'll have available months in advance, so they get at, they get also access to t- uh, chapters that are open before anyone else. Like we put, we'll post them up on Wattpad, but we won't tell anybody except our exclusive followers. I might have to go do that. Because <laughs> I think oh, yeah, I- they get it. They yeah. get access to exclusive giveaways, events, it's just some crazy stuff. So you're more than just pu- doing more than just publishing books. You're building a community. Yep. Yep. Well, that's pretty awesome, and I definitely wish you guys luck for stuff in the future. And thank you for okay. taking the time out of your day to talk with me. It's been fun getting to hear more of your story and being able to help you share your story and what you're doing over at Fireside. And I just hope you have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing what you guys do next. Special thanks to all of our listeners for stopping by and listening to this wonderful tale told by the fireside. Next up, we'll be talking to a friend of mine who codes medical software by day and makes games by night. In the meantime, if you're a creator who has a story to tell, feel free to reach out to me and I'll see what we can do. Because creators make great things together, and I think it's about time we took over the world. So I will see you next time on An Incomplete Guide to World Domination. An Incomplete Guide to World Domination is written, edited, and directed by me, Brianna Toiber, with music by Patrick Chester of Chester Studios. If you'd like to check out more of his work, I'd definitely recommend going to chesterstudios.com.